Let's just know. Greetings. And good evening. And welcome to the National Welfare Rights Union celebration of the, the welfare, 55 years of the welfare rights movement and 30 year celebration of the formation of the National Welfare Rights Union. Tonight will be an exciting program and we are so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Uh, my name is Michelle Tinglin Clemens. I'm uh, a founding member of the National Welfare Rights Union. I'll be your MC this evening. Uh, first, we're gonna open with a prayer from Reverend Liz Theo Harris, who's one of the uh, co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, National Call for a Moral Revival. Somebody's Reverend Liz? I am here. Yep, I'll be on video in one second. I'm so sorry. Okay. Or in two minutes. Well, you can get the prayer without the visual. Because we know you're here. Greetings, Reverend Liz. Did we lose? What you? else? Hi. Can you give what us? What else do we have in store for today before we get into the prayer? Uh, before we get into the prayer, we're going to have an exciting program. We're actually going to hear some testimonies that we weren't able to get in during our truth commission uh, from uh, two two members of welfare rights, people who have are, are part of the fight back. We're also going to hear um, from, we're going to hear some presentations with quotes from leaders who have transitioned and gone on. And we're going to get, have uh, some members, the current members talk about the impact of those on today and our current struggle. What we want people to know is that we're fully engaged in this struggle. It's a struggle that we know that we will win. Why will we win? Because one, we have right on our side. That's the first reason. And second of all, because we represent a group of people who are part of the class that makes and produces everything in this country. And I see Reverend Liz and her, and her um, smiling face. So Reverend Liz, can you grace us with a poem? I'm sorry, with a prayer. And a prayer, yes, indeed. So it's so good to be with everybody this evening and um, so much love and appreciation to the <laughs> National Welfare Rights Union and, and all we have been able to do together. Um, let us pray. God of justice, God of righteousness, God of love and mercy. We have heard your cries, your cries to lift from the bottom so that everybody may rise. Your cries, against, woe against those who pass unjust love, unjust laws, who deprive the poor and women of their rights and make homeless children your prey. We've heard your cries that we are to do justice and to love kindness. And so we ask that you be with us this evening uh, with those that are gathered, those that have gone before to pave a new way for a just society as we remember them and keep the fight going. In your many names, we pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Reverend Liz. I know we'll hear again from you later in a few minutes, but thank you. Uh, now uh, we are going to we're going to hear from the history and celebration. We're getting a full report from the commissioners who participated in the Truth Commission on uh, that we just had June 26th. So uh, first, we're going to hear a testimony from Joe Peary out of Chicago. Joe, are you with us? I am. Yes, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. Take it away. Okay, all right. Um, I'm a public housing resident 
living in an area once known as Cabrini Green. I am formerly homeless. Less than two blocks from my home, there are 440 vacant units of housing in the Cabrini Row houses. Originally, we were promised that people would move out temporarily, that the apartments would be renovated, and then people would move back in. Promise broken. Those 440 units have been empty for 10 years. Meanwhile, homeless people quietly die on the streets. That's blood on the hands of the Chicago Housing Authority. When we uh, complained about it, we were told by HUD officials that they're saving public housing by making it private. Today, all public housing in this city is run by private realty corporations. The results, homelessness everywhere. Our lease states that we can be evicted for criminal activity without an arrest, a conviction or proof. As I speak to you now, we are fighting to keep a mom in her home being evicted under this part of the lease. There are no charges, arrest or conviction against her, only allegations. While the Constitution guarantees all Americans innocence until proven guilty, we are guilty until proven innocent. A young man who lived in one of the 440 vacant units, who was 16 years old at the time, was arrested because he had a joint in his pocket. The case was thrown out of court, but that didn't stop the Chicago Housing Authority from using this part of the lease to threaten his family with eviction and remove him from the home. With nowhere to go, the boy became homeless and dropped out of school. For some reason, child endangerment laws did not apply to the Chicago Housing Authority nor their corporate partners. On the first floor of my building, a public housing teenager was accused of smoking marijuana. The police were called. Lacking evidence, they left. The next morning, his mom received an eviction notice. Ironically, in the same week, a man in a condo on the seventh floor died from smoking crack. His family received condolences and sympathy without even a hint of eviction. Corporations make millions selling marijuana on the stock exchange while we're made homeless if we use it. If this is not Jim Crow, then somebody tell me what is. This has nothing to do with crime and everything to do with profit. Public housing was built to house homeless families of World War I veterans. Realty corporations opposed it and called it socialism. However, factory owners supported it because no matter how low the slave wages were that they paid us, our rent was only 25% of that, guaranteeing them uh, millions Reminder. of dollars. As soon as those factories were no longer needed to, uh, uh, as soon as those factories no longer needed our cheap labor, the HUD budget was cut and mass eviction started. Realtors were given lucrative uh, contracts to manage all public housing, like putting a fox in charge of, of a uh, hen house. Our lease went from three pages to over 140 pages long with dozens of ways to deny basic human rights and evict us. The Title 24 codes of federal regulations are I'm constantly being rewritten to back all this up. If housing has become a basic human right, oppressive CFRs must be removed along with those private realtors and HUD-based housing must be expanded to house all our homeless brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, was, that was extremely powerful. What is the idea that we have to have empty housing that people can't live in? Mm -hmm. uh, now we're gonna hear from uh, Rick Tingling Clemens, who in addition to being a commissioner and my husband uh, is also um, a founding member of Welfare Rights Union. He's gonna give us a report on genocide. Thank you, Michelle. and. Um, and I'm really pleased and glad that uh, Welfare Rights will allow me this amount of time to express what is something as deep and a concern of my of, of us all. And that is, in the United States of America, for 400 years, there have been mass murders of, of Native American people and, and, and African American people and, and, and gay and, and lesbian people and, and, and all of the fringe groups that the United States doesn't want to necessarily take care of, they, they kill them. So we're taking this to the UN because every 36 hours a black person is killed in the United States and still is happening today. Tamir Rice, uh, one of the many cases where it is so clear that the racist uh, police department, which is only here, by the way, the police are only here to protect the property of the rich. They are not our friends. They are not here to help us. And defunding the police will bring the necessary funds to all of the other areas that we need to 
to bring us up and out of poverty. We want to be up and out of poverty now. And so we're going to bring this to the UN and let the UN know that we are not only the first, but we're the third group of folks who have uh, brought this case to the UN. It's funny. The UN was started, the charter started in 1948. In 1948, two of the most notorious apartheid governments were founded. One was South Africa, the other one was Israel. So this is where we are. And we should stand together as a working class to save all Reminder. and all people we will save. And thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Rick. Okay, and now we're going to be graced with testimony from Pat Harris. Pat, did you make it? I think I see you up there. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Okay. I'm trying to figure what I suppose, yeah. I guess I'm talking about the direct care workers of because I got in, you know, y'all got to forgive me because I'm I'm working and I'm all feel good, so I don't even know where I'm at today. <laughs> That's it. I hear you. Uh, well, well, you know, this is welfare rights. You know, we got we, we covering every everything. Everything. Um, I guess I was told I should be talking. Well, I'm. Um, well, right now I'm a retired public safety officer, and then I got into the field of. Um, care worker after my daughter told me how bad the mentally handicapped people were being treated. And, uh, she was raised with my brother who was severely handicapped, mentally handicapped. So I've just, I was told to talk about the feel how I work and, and like I'm, it's, it's bad because some of the staff, they feed these people like they feed an animal or they talk to them like they're not human. Uh, the agencies don't seem to care it's like it's all about money it seemed to be in the care of the care uh so uh i work more than i should because that's why i'm feeling like this because that's half the time the the young people they hire don't come show up don't come in when they do come in they be on their cell phones the whole time uh and uh it's just it's like it's just really sad how we treat uh our people that need us, how we treat our seniors, how we treat handicapped people. And the, you know, so, um, I don't really, I had a list of what to say, but I don't, um, just not in feel good today. So I'm not going to say too much is that, um, um, that uh, I don't know what, to, you know, so just forgive me today. Cause I don't know what else to, somebody can ask me some questions and I can answer them or something like that. Well, you know, Pat, it sounds to me like you were talking about like a lot of the issues that we're talking about. First off, you're talking about caregiving. You know, mm -hmm. we really focused on the fact that most of the care is delivered by people who are not being compensated. And that does, and it's the, some of the most valuable work that we have and that we need. So uh, people, you're right, people have been treated like they're disposable. And that's part of what this struggle is about. That's part of what yeah. welfare rights is committed to. Uh, the, the company, and I call them, I shouldn't, no, I'm not going to tell you what I call this young group. They be hired. I said, I sometimes think they just hire, go in a corner and hire, say, you want to work? And because they don't, they, they get so, I had to be trained and I was trained when I took care of my own brother, but they don't even train. They put them in here and they do a little, you know, a little shoe shine, chain, you know, and then they come in here and like I said, the girls actually come on the phone, they stay on the phone, don't, don't, you know, and the, the company's just getting richer. Uh, this particular home I'm in, it's just when I came in here to help out for a while, you know, there was rags on the window for in the bathroom. The couch you sat down, you went to the floor. So I bought wood and put it up in the, you know, the, you know, you know, to bring the couch up. So it's just, Reminder. they got money come in, okay? And they, they got all this food stamps they get and they still buy them below average food. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. It's just really sad. Well, you, but you know what, Pat? I think that you have raised really critical issues mm -hmm. that the commission uh, that was pulled out from testimonies from the 26th and is definitely going to be incorporated in the submission that we make to the UN. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for coming in, tired as you are, overworked yes, as you are, you. 
to share your struggle with us. Thank you so okay. much. All right, thank you. And now we'll hear from Larry. I'm sorry, Larry. I'm, I'm slipping, but this this is uh, he's also a member of our, our board, the Wealth National Welfare Rights Union board, and he's going to talk to us about the economic human rights uh, charges that were made by the by the testifiers on the 26th and today. Great. So um, I'm going to give a brief report um, from the perspective of the economic human rights that, that came about through the uh, Truth Commission that happened on Saturday, as well as the testimonies that have happened since then. I want to mention first that I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the other commissioners, which included Maureen Taylor, Ciara Taylor, Savina Martin, Brian Mallory, Willie Baptist, uh, Viola Washington, um, and, uh, and Rick Tingling Clemens. Um, so I, just to, to kind of re reinforce, when we're, the Truth Commission has been used as a tool by Welfare Rights Union for, for, for a long time, particularly to offer testimonies from witnesses to the economic human vi rights violations that have happened to them directly. Um, and again, when we're talking about the economic human rights violations, we're referring to articles 23, 25, and 26 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which was signed by the US and passed in 1948, um, and has never been enforced in this country. Um, this includes the rights to food, the right to clothing, the right to housing, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to living wage jobs. And when we as a truth commission, you know, uh, I mean, when we as a, as a group of commissioners looked at the testimonies, we went back and looked at them from the perspective of what were the violations that were set out, um, who was responsible for the denial of economic human rights, could the violations be permitted, and potential solutions. So there was a host of there was a host of just um, dramatic and heartrending violations that, that ranged from in terms of the rights to food and living wage jobs, to the rights to health care, um, to, the, to the right to housing, um, et, et cetera. And, um, and most of which you can, some of the highlights you can see from the report that will be sent out to you. Reminder. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you can look back in terms of who is responsible, though it's legislative, executive, judicial, um, that, and, and as we looked at the potential solutions, um, there, there were a host of various policy things, including having living wage, raising the minimum wage to a true living wage, um, that, um, that we included, that we forced the right to housing for adequate affordable housing. And, and, and that there's um, single payer true affordable health care, and, and that there's a guaranteed family income that ensures that all people make the basic standard of living. But ultimately, um, the only way that we're going to be able to eradicate poverty is for the poor and the dispossessed to, to enforce their rights. And we need to be, have, have, have to be organized and united and th in, in an effort that is led by the poor in order to eradicate poverty in this country. Thank you, Larry Bresler. That was a good summation of a report. And I don't know how you squeezed it in, but you got it all in. And we want to thank you for that, uh, for indicating what the, the, what the Truth Commission illustrated that we already know, that we're dealing with a system that is not about meeting our needs. And now we're going to, uh-oh, let's do it again. <laughs> all right, sorry, folks. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, if you signed up on the mailing list, you'll be getting copies of the, the testimonies and the full commission report. So if you haven't, we urge you to do so. And now we'd like to, uh, we're gonna transition to Metal in the Sky, a video.
smiling because we recognize some of the images in there. All right, next we're going to hear from Reverend Liz. Reverend Liz, to talk about our partnership. I'm hey, sorry. thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and to everybody. Um, uh, indeed, we recognize many of the images and faces and leaders that are in that video um, that inspire us every day to keep on uh, struggling, keep on fighting, keep on organizing. Um, so I just wanted to be here um, on this anniversary of the National Welfare Rights Union to, to recognize, to recognize the amazing leadership, prophetic, visionary leadership of Marian Kramer, of Maureen Taylor, and of everybody uh, from the board of the, the National Welfare Rights Union from its found, founding 30 years ago and all the way through today. Um, I just wanna share uh, so much uh, respect um, as the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, we know that uh, this National Welfare Rights Union and the organizing drive um, that has come out of it, um, the struggle around water, around welfare, around um, taking away poverty and not children, uh, the, 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 the drive that we all must fight to win uh, a right to, to thrive and not just merely survive, 
Uh, this and so much more is at the very core of, of all the work that the Poor People's Campaign does in 45 states across the country amongst dozens and dozens of faith um, bodies nationally and internationally amongst hundreds of organizations um, who are following the leadership of the National Welfare Rights Union. Um, uh, much like uh, the National Welfare Rights Organization uh, was so instrumental in the founding and the formation and in the, the program and the, the push of the 1967 and 1968 Poor People's Campaign um, that, that um, still has to be fought for today. Um, so I, I just stand in, in great unity and great love and great respect and in great solidarity with the National Welfare Rights Union. I, I um, am a proud, proud member of, of this union. Uh, this is the union I'm a member of and, um, and bring that everywhere I go um, and, and know uh, anyone that, that has already been involved or is just going to going to find out about the National Welfare Rights Union, that, that this is where change is going to come, um, that this is where uh, fighters and thinkers and educators and dreamers um, are made, and that we indeed, as we say in the Poor People's Campaign, are going to keep on moving forward together uh, with all of you and not one step back. And so um, just uh, looking forward to, to meeting more and more on the battlefield, as we just saw in that video. All right. Thank you so much, Reverend Liz. We appreciate, we are both National Welfare Rights Union, appreciate the partnership. Uh, we wish you well and you have, you have our, 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 our hope and love for you, Dad. Take care. And now, Sabrine, uh, Sabrine actually testified at the June 26th uh, Truth Commission, but Sabrine, one of our warriors, is also a poet. So she is now going to bring to us a poem that speaks to the struggle in which we're engaged. Sabrine. It's a pleasure to be here again. It's a pleasure to be fighting for a cause that we know will bring victory. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. The title of this poem is Broken Bonds. Broken bonds seen each day. Poor children of color become government prey. Misinformation makes society blind. Mainstream media printing falsified lies. Fostered adoption. Run amok, a pipeline to prison. Who can we trust? A damaged village repeats an age old fear. Beloved children will disappear. Grief stricken families. Shattered ties, broken bonds, a legacy dies. Ashe. 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 Golly, Miss Sabrine, we knew that you could testify, but this poetry is really serious. Yeah. And I, yeah, thank you so much for yeah. that. And it's it's really a good intro, even though I, I, I did a little rejuggling. Sorry about that. We're now going to hear from two of our stalwarts, people who are really <clears throat> uh, made it one of the main reasons why we are still here after 30 years. I have to say that the system that's oppressing us has been a big help. But uh, the folks who are helping us to organize the fight back, Marion and Maureen, are going to speak to us about the mission statement. All right. The missing statement. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, uh, I'm Open going to uh, 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 start uh, a look. Ms. Ma, where are y'all? Mission statement and about the organizing drive. And what I'm going to uh, say very briefly is that the mission statement is a document that's under revision 
much about it has not changed. We have a singular focus, and that is to fight for the right. What's wrong with this mute? What do we need to do to make certain that people can eat, they have a roof, they have health care, those things that mean a quality of life. So uh, I'm going to hand this off to Marion, who's going to speak the um, bulk of our time around this question of why is there an organizing drive at this time? So uh, my national chair is going to take this. So uh, go ahead and I will go back on mute. Well, thank you, Maureen. And thanks for, um, to the rest of you, you know, uh, Michelle and, and uh, the committee and the tech people, uh, all of us uh, for being here today. We got a long road ahead of us. And one of the reasons why I kind of sat down and thought that we better put the National Welfare Rights Union back in the street and organize them again. It's because we have, we have never faced the type of conditions that we have had, had to face in the last two years. And people are still out here dying uh, because of the lack of uh, you know uh, medication to get rid of this stuff and what have you. It's time for uh, welfare rights to rise up again and began to go first of all to, you've seen <clears throat> some of these leaders on here that have been out in the fields for a long time. We need all of us in the fields, organizing in our communities and making sure that we know who's ne next door to us and, and come together as um, the soldiers for the, for the um, for our children, you know, we don't have long, you know, I know I don't have too much longer to live, but at the same time, I want a better world. I want a better world. And so in order to do that, then the right people got to be the ones that step forward to help to us to get this better world. Oh. They killing us every day, every day. Every day. They using food to, uh, to try to keep us in shape as far as, when I say in shape, kowtowing to the capitalists and what have you. It's up to us to educate our community. These are the places where, where they, they have the most fear a lot of times. So, you know, I'm, this is the reason why we want to start training people that look, you are not only a mother or a father, but you're gonna to have to be a soldier in, the, in this fight for a better, better world for our children. And, and we need you now. Look, I'll, I'll leave you with this. You might not think that you are smart, but you're smarter than anybody out here because a lot of the people that's uh, below the poverty level learn to survive better than, than uh, the folks that throwing the bread out to us a lot of times. So we must let those folks know you need to join in with us where we can make sure that uh, caregivers don't have to go through what they're going through now. You know, they treating them like like they black on the on the uh, plantation. plantation and what have you. So we're asking you join this fight. This fight is your fight. This fight is our fight. I know I want to fight to the very end and make sure that I left my little print somewhere. But the the thing is. Our seniors are dying daily without being able to say goodbye to their children. Our children don't know who the enemy is and killing one another. I mean, it's up to us to draw those lines. It's up to us to bring pull other organizations together. We've done it in the past to pull them together that we don't have to be fighting one another. We got an enemy that we must deal with. And if you want to one last thing, and that is that 
we're still in a water fight. The capitalist is still trying to make sure that this water become nothing but privacy, a, a private uh, property. We have to stop that. There should be public. That means that we own the water, not them. They need to crawl on their legs and we give them a small bucket for the week. I am so glad to be a part of this and so glad that you know, that y'all have hung on, but now it's in your hand. What we want to do is, and if you out there listening, you're welcome to come and join us. If you live close to someone you have seen on, on this TV, give them your name and address and join this fight because we want to make sure when we say National Welfare Rights Union, uh, it's time to take to the street or it's time to make sure that people stop coming in your community, taking advantage of you. And uh, we, we, we're gonna step, we're gonna step hard and we're gonna, we're gonna educate in the process because the best way you can educate a lot of time is when you're on your feet. But thank you, we, we, want, we want a whole lot of soldiers that are out here and we know they need to join this fight. There should be no, never should there be anybody without a home. No. We're gonna have to get back to that. Reminder. Never, so therefore it's up to us to make sure that we march in the same way and march in with one another. Thank you. Thank you, Ma Marion. Thank you, Ma Maureen. I'm sorry, Ms. Mo, uh, Ms. Marion. Uh, mm -hmm. They well, Al, you can see you can see a little bit of some of them in some of the videos, but um, they are just an inkling of the power that the Welfare Rights Union is trying to is bringing to the forefront and urging you to come be a part of. Um, before we move, we, we're going to we're going to share with you some videos and quotes from some of our, our historic leaders. But before we do that, we want to hear from Margaret Prescott, who's going to give us a brief summation of um, one of the at early actions of the National Welfare Rights Organization that really helped to not just put it on the map. That was more than that. But what it really did was it helped to stop some of the worst things that were being proposed for 20 years. And now the National Welfare Rights Union is, is picking up that fight. We never left it. Margaret? Well, thank you so very much, uh, Michelle, um, Sister Mo, and our chair, uh, Marion Kramer, Reverend Liz, and all of the organizers of this event. So happy to be in the trenches with you. A brief piece of history from the National Welfare Rights Organization. In 1977, during the UN Women's Decade, the United States had its first congressionally mandated conference on women. It was held in Houston, Texas. It was in November. The goal of the conference was to come up with a platform of action to send to President Carter for implementation. Elections were held in all of the U.S. states and territories and delegates elected to go to the Houston conference. Beulah Saunders, who was one of the presidents of the National Welfare Rights Organization, myself, that's me, Margaret Prescott from Black Women for Wages for Housework, along with the representative from the American Indian movement were part of the New York State delegation. When we got to Houston, we met up with delegates from National Welfare Rights Organization from other states, including Johnny Tillman, who was there, another president of National Welfare Rights, Frankie Jeter. We were faced with a draft resolution on welfare that was a workfare proposal. But together, all of us, the National Welfare Rights Organization, those of us from the Wages for Housework campaign, we went to work. We threw out the workfare resolution. We entirely rewrote it. We opposed workfare. We included language that women receiving welfare should have the dignity of it being called a wage. And then we organized to win the vote. It was historic. Many say that victory was part of what held off federalizing workfare for two decades, an important slice of history of the National Welfare Rights Organization. Congratulations to the organization and to the union on this anniversary event. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. 
that's some really important history. And I just as you as you look at the rest of this program, I want to remind people that one of the things that Welfare Rights Union recognized early on is that we have to record our own history. We cannot depend on a system that is clearly our enemy to do it for us. Um, we're now going to hear, uh, um, now going to see a video. We're going to hear a quote uh, on the beginnings of the national of the welfare rights movement, the national movement, um, and we're going to hear the person who's going to lead us in this discussion and this uh, little retrospective. Oh, Viola. <laughs> I felt like the lowest thing on earth when I went to the welfare. I felt like they were all better than me, that they could walk all over me, which I got down on my hands and knees to them and begged them for coats and boots for these children at, at wintertime. Basic needs. Amen. Some of the people in the original organizing around welfare rights, a lot of us came from uh, the civil rights movement to help get that on, on the road and what have you. We're trying to get everybody to stick together. One person just don't have to fight for this step. All of us fight for each other. Well, we go into, into the welfare office if necessary to represent probably one or two of our members because welfare rights is a membership organization. But once we arrive there, it might be the whole waiting room of people that we end up staying all day with to make sure that they get quality services and we represent all the people there. Some of our earlier members there, you know, these are war veterans. I mean, women who have been on welfare, these were some of the fighters, the backbone of whatever democracy is with these women here. Courage, they, you know, rebuke you in the name of the devil, and they very religious, and roll their sleeves up and would punch a policeman before you could blink your eye. You know, you weren't prepared to fight, That's and right. they just go. But some of, some the, of them were uh, on know, a kidney machine right. three days a week. Courage. Uh, Thelma right. Echols, uh, Beulah Sanders, all of them, but they were always ready. They would come off that kidney machine and be sick. You know, Johnny and be ready to go, yeah, ready to take over. Lost both of her legs, Johnny Tillman, and that's when I mm -hmm. came in. Uh, by the time I came along, uh, the Johnny Tillman model, <laughs> which is the victims of this fight need to be in the management, need to be in control of what happens. Right. And, and I was recruited and trained under that model, which is the correct model. Let's mm -hmm. move ahead with the victims of this fight who don't uh, uh, bargain, who don't sell out, who don't get scared. The only thing they do is die before we get to where we're going, but they never give up. Basic needs. The situation changed that a lot of the women ended up in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. They were already in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. So, you know, an organization like Welfare Rights, which is people don't tend to think of it, is a part, is a part of the labor force, mm -hmm. began to have to change too. So back in the 70s. Okay, sorry. You're going to get that in a minute. But uh, Ms. Viola Francois Washington with the uh, New Orleans Welfare Rights Organization. It's going to speak to the beginnings. Viola? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, hey, I'm so glad to be here. And thank you all so much. Um, just to reflect on, on, on just what I've heard so far and, and, and to, to remember Beulah Sanders. I mean, an awesome lady, my um, woman of my own heart. Um, you know, she talked about uh, the struggle continues. She talked about, um, you know, to me, I, I, I got out of it. Power sees nothing without a struggle. And we have to continue to struggle to make this, 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 this work. And we have to do political education and organize, organize. And, you know, that's what was happening then. And that's what's happening now. They was talking about, um, I read a lot of her quotes where, she talked about um, um, poverty and how um, free labor, and now we're, we're going through the same thing today with this minimum wages, um, that's, that's free labor, that's cheap, cheap wages, you know? So we're going through the same thing today. And I just see that, um, you know, human rights violation 
is happening to us every day, daily, and we must try to change that. And we, we are the only one that can change that. And just to see the struggle that was happening then and see that it's, it is happening now. So the struggle continues. And like Mary was saying earlier, we have to be on the march and on the journey of making sure that we are in front of all of these things and stop these folks from these bad behaviors. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time and, and we have to stop them of these bad behaviors because we do have some human rights laws. And I would like to see it happen in an in a anti-racist way where uh, policy will be uh, written for our good. Amen, thank you. Amen. Okay, next on changing conditions. And person who will be addressing this is Savina, Reverend Savina Martin. And all of these people who are coming up here, folks, are members of the Wealth National Welfare Rights Union. Mm -hmm. Right. We are national and we are all over. Representing the National Welfare Rights Union every day. Yes, indeed. Situation. Not only did we were able to uh, expand the services, the situation changed that a lot of the women ended up in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. They were already in the workforce, you know, getting better jobs. So, you know, an organization like Welfare Rights, which is people don't tend to think of it, is a part, is a part of the labor force, mm -hmm. began to have to change too. So back in the 70s, you know, the national office ceased, but we maintained a lot of the local organizations. In 1987, we formed the National Welfare Rights Union. Annie Smart and I, mm -hmm. and uh, Arena Edwards, and some more of the old welfare writers uh, have been approached on a national level. Could we have a national organization again because of the program that was being pushed out of Washington at the time? Economics changed. Uh huh. We Situation changed. Things were changing. Mm -hmm. We saw it, but didn't know what it was yet. Okay. So we called the meeting. Michelle, Michelle Tingling Clemens came in mm -hmm. at that time. That's and we strange. fundraised and we had the first founding convention <laughs> at Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. But we formed the, uh, the uh, National Welfare Rights Union. And we wanted it to be a union because uh, it could not be just people on public assistance like in the past. It had to be a, a unified type of thing between the employed, unemployed, organized, unorganized, folks that were facing the type of problems that poor people face, oh, yeah. and we had to solidify. We had to make sure that we fought for unity there, and this union was that type of thing that we wanted to fight. We designed and began to carry out this campaign. We had a, a, a summit in Philadelphia where 500 people made it their way to that summit. We didn't, uh, the only grant we received to help us with this summit was from Reverend Yvonne Dell. We have got to break the silence and boldly identify poverty as a sin against God. We've got to regain our moral sense of urgency now not tomorrow, now, not next week, now. The demand is up and out of poverty, now. Uh, and she gave us $10,000, which we used to help poor people to get to that summit. But basically, a lot of people had to fundraise themselves to get to the summit. My name is Marvie Willis, and I'm here from Columbus, Ohio. And I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Out of Houston, Texas. St. Paul, Virginia. I'm from the Lakota Orioles Indian Reservation in Wisconsin. I'm a lawyer in Philadelphia. I'm an asbestos victim. An organizer for the Milwaukee Jobs with Peace campaign. Clara's House Shelter. Where I'm currently working with some of the homeless people there. I'm Mary Devitt and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. <sighs> I'm Anthony Tharp from uh, Chicago, Illinois. Oh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. Hi, my name is CJ, and I'm from Detroit, Wayne County Union of the Homeless. What was so interesting, some of these people had never attended no kind of conference before in their lives, you know. And they were at this, at this summit. We came out of that summit and decided certain campaigns needed to take, take uh, begin to be organized. We wanted everybody up and out of poverty in the United States, in the world, really. That was the slogan. Mm -hmm. up and out of poverty. Uh, we were going to participate in the... Um, a homeless march, mm -hmm. but our demand was going to be 
that the homeless had to speak for themselves and lead that march. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, already, we're already on our way to Washington. All right. We're going October what? October 7th. You want us to piggyback on that? Yeah, well, listen, that's for everything. Yeah. That's for wages, that's for housing, that's for food, that's for clothing, that's everything. We waited for the opportunity for us to speak. We got to realize that they had no intention of letting us speak. So let's take it in. Let's take it in, because we fired up. All right. Let's bring it in. We fired up. We fired up. We fired up. We fired up. The women, they don't think about it. All they say is, Fuck it, we need housing, we need homes, we need food, and they leave. And I follow it. It seemed like every time somebody spoke for us, we got more and more in the hole. Reverend Savina? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that brings back so many mem memories. Um, oh, yes. And happy anniversary uh, to welfare rights that literally saved my life and taught me how to fight. And that um, we could speak for ourselves and we could think for ourselves. But tonight I'm, I'm gonna read a quote from um, Annie Smart, former vice president of the National Welfare Rights Union. Can America survive without poverty? If the answer is no, then in order for America to survive, it must have some type of public benefits in order to regulate the victims of poverty, the permanent army of the unemployed and underemployed. If the answer is yes, then everybody will have to be brought up and out of poverty now. If we are to accomplish our overall goal of up and out of poverty now, then we, as victims of poverty, need to know our history, know the objective processes, strategies, and tactics to move forward. <clears throat> we are not fighting for a trickle-down economy, but for society to work in our interest, to end homelessness, to provide health care and free and quality education for all, and to end hunger. And that again is by Annie Smart, Vice President of the National Welfare Rights Union. Thank you so much, Rev. You're welcome. And for those who remember that, that was her up there lead the homeless march now, saying, okay, bring it in. <laughs> yeah, we, we saw, we saw, yeah. we see it. Okay, and the next uh the next section is on new union tactics. And for that, we're going to hear from uh, a reflection uh, by Ciara. You know, we've got these uh, affiliate members at states have welfare rights in, in New Orleans, welfare rights in California, welfare rights in Arizona, Washington, uh, D.C., uh, Seattle, Washington. And she's calling folks and we're getting information. Wait a minute. There's a trend going on here. What's happening? People are being laid off all over the place. All of our members across the country are doing food stamps for factory workers, for meal workers, and people are being off work. They've got all these workfare programs where they want you to work off your grant. And you know, as it became clearer and clearer, this productivity issue, where now they don't need us to work anymore. So you don't have what, what do you need health care for? You can't produce anything for them, so let's remove that. What do you need education for? You can never serve this master anymore. Why should we care if you can read and write? Let's take that away. You don't need housing and clothes. You, you, it's all right to stand on a corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. 20 years ago, you never saw anything like that. And now we got all, we have families standing on street corners. The woman and the child, veterans, signed it, baby standing right there, will work for food. Because we know that today in the richest country in the world, we have no business sleeping in doorways and bus, and bus stations. We have no business sleeping in boxes. We have no business standing in a soup line begging for a piece of bread. We have no business waiting for somebody to give us some clothes to put on our back. 
We have no business taking our small babies and sitting in Burger Kings like I had to do and breastfeed my baby with a quote-unquote bag lady to give me a dollar to buy coffee. We don't have to do that today. So what we did was we organized to fight back and to take back what's ours because we are the sons and the brothers and the sisters and the aunts and uncles and grandchildren of the people that built this country, and this is ours. <laughs> Welcome, Ciara. Thank you. We, the victims of poverty, must go back to the basics, hit the streets and organize by the thousands. We are over 60 million strong. We have the necessary knowledge of our needs, food, clothing, healthcare, and housing. We must organize to show the so-called representatives that don't represent our interests and they cannot represent us. We must learn from our past campaigns, such as the electoral campaigns of when Annie Smart of the Welfare Rights ran for Louisiana State Senate, and when Dottie Stevens ran for governor of Massachusetts. We must let the so-called representatives know that we have learned their tricks to keeping us in poverty. But it is time now for us to fight to abolish poverty if our children are going to have a future. We will be successful because God is on our side and therefore we have all the time in the world. We will not sit back. We will not sit by and wait for a leader because we are all leaders. Join our fight because it is a fight for the future of this world, a fight where there will be no homelessness or hunger, but a world where we will enjoy all the fruits of our societal labor. Mrs. Arena Edwards, past treasurer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. Uh, my name is... Yeah. Yo, right? This feel, I, I'm just, it is such a privilege to be here in this moment with you all. Shout out for National Welfare Rights Union and National Welfare Rights Organization for bringing us to this moment um, and bringing us all together. Um, I really appreciated this. And I also want to say shout out to Peter Kanoy uh, and the media team that he pulled together to bring us uh, to bring this history uh, into this moment, into life, um, all of those who have been organizing uh, this movement, and uh, Colleen and Carolyn, who are behind the scenes right now, and Kristen rocking the tech. I think that this quote by Mrs. Arrhenia uh, Stevens is, uh, or Edwards is so important because National Welfare Rights Union has been able to and why I believe that this movement has been so successful because it has been able to understand the need for us to respond to the actual situation at hand. Uh, the affinity sign of uh, the, the logo of the National Welfare Rights Union, a reminder not only that we are all connected in this fight, but that the struggle continues and that we actually have a past and a history that tells us that if we struggle, we will win. If we are to bring the most impacted to recognize the leadership of the poor and dispossessed and unite us on, along all uh, sides of struggle, across lines of historical division, if we are to do this, if we are to build the organization uh, and, and, and get into step with one another, that we know that we will win uh, liberation uh, for all people, that we understand that um, the poor and dispossessed, we have the means, we have the knowledge, we have the power uh, to really, uh, to, to really uh, turn around this incredibly horrendous uh, uh, structural or, or, or system that we're living under of, of extreme poverty, militarism, systemic racism, environmental and moral devastation as the poor people's campaign and national call for more revival points out i know i'm going on for so long i'm so happy to be here happy anniversary national union our national welfare rights union thank you thank you thank you ciara uh, you see folks we not we don't just have warriors that we're recognizing but we're growing more 
Thank you, Sierra. It's just one of those new one of our new warriors. Okay, next we're going to be do, having uh, someone uh, have a piece on a human rights framework, and the person reflecting on this will be Colleen. Well, I went down to the rich man's house. We had to look at the question of poverty and looking at our human rights being violated. That's right. And link those two. And link them. So in New Orleans, at a national board meeting, we decided that we were going to start organizing around the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that under that, that we wanted that implemented in the United States to be the basis for to begin to eliminate poverty. Out of that, Kensington Welfare Rights, which is a part of the national, began to organize around it. I'm getting a human rights documentation form for one of the um, women who had cooked today. She was telling us her story. Okay, what's your name? Nina Johnson. Okay. Under Article 25, it's the right to well-being of a person and their family. That means food, housing, clothing, medical care, and other social services. Have you ever been denied or cut off welfare? Yes. Has your family ever gone without meals because there wasn't enough money for food? Yes. Uh, same thing here. I want my kids to have a, a better life than I have now. Thank you, man. You're welcome. You're welcome. And that became the first fight around going to the, to the UN, the march. Hi everyone, I am Colleen West McCoy and I'm gonna share a quote from Dottie Stevens. Dottie Stevens, the former vice president of the National Welfare Rights Union said, we will always be in poverty unless we, the victims of poverty, organize ourselves using the three throng, tr thronged approach, the street, the court, and the legislature. We need to register to vote and run ourselves, the victims of poverty for political office at all levels. We bring empirical data and we can address our own needs. All we need is common sense and a desire to serve in the interests of the victims of poverty. We need to put in place policies like a right to th thrive, not barely survive. The truth is our shield and voting is one of our weapons. If you've never voted before, register to vote now. We must be the instrument for change. We must join the army to fight poverty. Hunger is now, homelessness is now. Our children need education now. We need healthcare now. So we must come up and out of poverty now. Uh, Dottie Stevens uh, died in 2014, but her wisdom and spirit lives on in our organizing work today. She was a poor mom, an organizer, and a true poverty scholar. She talked about the necessity of organizing using every tool and avenue we have, but she also put that into action and made struggle a school. Dottie ran for governor in Massachusetts. She edited Survival News and organized Survival Incorporated. She reminds us that the poverty, problem of poverty does not come from a lack of abundance. There's enough in the world for everyone. And yet we must fight for our right, to th our right to the things we need to survive. Our human rights like water, healthcare, housing, food, education. And Dottie reminds us that voting rights, elections and policy work are all critical to our organizing. Uh, that's where our collaboration with the Poor People's Campaign is critical and how we, we move the right to fare well forward joining those waves of nonviolent moral direct action and developing uh, moral policy um, and budgets that put people first. And with welfare rights and our, our coming organizing drive, we are changing what is political po politically possible. Uh, and together we are demanding to make real our human rights. They're human rights that we have and we're gonna make them real. 
And so with Dottie, we say up and out of poverty now. Hallelujah. We're with you on that one. Okay, thank you so much, Colleen. Another one of our, our, our new young warriors. And now we got, um, we have, uh, oh, we have a little section on look alike versus think alike. This is it's an important, this is an important concept, folks. I hope you get a lot out of this one. Uh, we're going to be hearing from, uh, I believe it's Brianna Taylor com uh, reflecting on this. I'm in Chicago at a meeting. It's a Democratic uh, uh, National Convention, and I'm there. And there's fighting going on in the streets. I'm trying to hit somebody. I don't know who to hit, but you know, I'm there with, the, with whoever's in the, in the streets and whatnot. And this cop was about to hit me upside my head, and a white guy who I did not know, a student just like me, jumped on me and took the blow. So by the time uh, I got back uh, to Detroit, and began, you know, I thought I need to sit down and review a lot of issues. There's something wrong here. And I began to change some attitudes about some things because it became clear that it's not a black and a white fight. We're getting in the step to win our freedom. All of these different fights are the same fight. And I want us to conclude our thinking. We're walking together that way. And you can take every fight you got with you, but we're walking that way. Anybody that gets in the way, too many black people are the ones that are most uh, exploited. Get out the way. We walk in this way. I ain't interested in trying to build an army of people that look like me. I want to build an army of people that think like me. Then I can win. I win if we do that. They're going to try to split us. These people, oh, we heard that Annie was gay. Well, look, whatever Annie is, if she's walking this way, we're walking together. I heard that Lisa was tall. Well, whatever Lisa is, she's walking this way, I'm going with her. And that's the way they were, walking that way. The idea of organizing people who think this way, that's what we're after. We want more than folks who look like us. We've got to have folks who think like us. Uh, we, our reflections are Crystal Bernard. Crystal doesn't have any choice because she was born into this movement. <laughs> <laughs> She's also one of our new young fighters. Go ahead, girl. Certainly, I will be reading a quote by my grandmother and former president of MWRO, Diane Bernard. I happen to be a poor black mother. Don't tell me that a white mother who witnessed her three children burned up in a house fire is unfit to lead this struggle. She has a personal vendetta against the government. She'll fight harder than anybody who's out there just reading books and talking a bunch of bull crap because it sounds good and it feels good. She will fight because she has a personal stake, because they hurt her. Those are the kind of fighters we need and I'll follow her anywhere, anytime. We have to embrace those mothers, take them under our wings and give them the ammo they need to fight. That is a proper education about who the enemy is and where this enemy is and how we go about destroying this enemy and restructuring a society that could allow children to burn up because you don't have the money to pay for gas. And natural gas is so plentiful in this country that nobody should have to pay for it, Diane Bernard. So this quote to me clearly and powerfully speaks to the need for us in our organizing work to locate our enemy. In our current struggles, division has a new look and it has new tactics. And with the rise of social media and the sensationalizing of organizing work, we are easily conf confused and conflicted when trying to identify our common enemy. We have new phrases and groups and this and that, and people are forgetting that our struggles aren't happening theoretically. That our struggle is on the ground, in the houses, in the courts, in the grocery stores, and especially in the streets that our struggles 
are inflicted from the have nots who have looted and exploited our labor. That when we can grasp this concept that as grandma Diane explains, extends beyond race, creed or origin or color or regardless of in-group and out-group, then we will be one step closer to our visions of the future. We're poor, disenfranchised, black, brown and others can provide and thrive. Thank you, Ms. Crystal. You're welcome. I see, I see you living up to your reputation too. Oh yeah, we've got we've got new warriors coming along, folks. And that's what this struggle really is about. We know she's right. It's not a theoretical struggle. The struggle is real. All right. And now I believe we're gonna we're going to be graced with a, a water trailer. I think y'all heard Marion say earlier about hey, the fight for water is still on. Yes, this fight is still on. The watering facility is uh, where people have to drive in from miles and miles and miles and miles out with you know, their water barrels. They drive underneath the watering facility, they turn on the water. The longest I've gone without running water at one time has been eight weeks. I started to keep all of these water quality violations. Every single quarter, every single year. 2002, 2003, 2004, 2006. I've got two cemeteries on the back hill back here of family members that we've lost to cancer. EPA was like, look, you live in coal mining country and coal mining's dirty business. That was a direct quote. Barium, arsenic, vanadium. So it's, it's like an alphabet soup of, of the periodic table. Silicosis pneumoconiosis, radiation fibrosis. We are left with millions of cubic yards of radioactive materials that is scattered down the mountain sides and to our lands, our pastures, our agricultural lands, our streams, our lakes. To me, there's no such thing as quasi-sovereign. You're either sovereign or you're not. The monoculture of corn, soybean, Hog, it is the dominant force in Iowa politics. They want to externalize the costs of production by putting a mess in the river that those of us downstream who depend on those rivers for drinking water uh, have to finance to clean up. Ms. Trader called me $114,000. And we don't have a separate tank because it costs more than this house worth right now. This is along the Selma to Montgomery Marsh Trail. Every year, business people get on the bus and go and worship at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But all along, off these side roads where people are living in conditions that are akin to places around the world that don't have the kind of wealth that exists in this country, it makes absolutely no sense. On behalf of the 120,000 families who are getting their water turned off, we're following the crews and turning the water back on. You can't, you can't say and do bad things to welfare recipients unless you put a narrative out there. They would rather pay for cable than water. And you have to say that over and over and over and over again. 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013. I think I'll probably die thinking that I ain't done enough. 2015, 2016, 2017. What do we get for what we gave? And survival should be the bare minimum. Why they put those little signs over the people? 
That was me. I was trying to read something. So. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and and this is another one of our, our younger warriors, Brianna Parker. It's going to give us reflections. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Brianna. Uh, I'm going to read um, a quote from Claire McKin McClinton um, from Flint Democracy Defense League. So not only do we want the lead TTHM Lithuanium out of our water, but we want JP Morgan Chase, we want Viola, we want Wall Street, they're in our water too. We need them out of our water along with the toxins. So I'll start by saying happy anniversary welfare rights. And um, I think throughout, throughout the day, we've seen like water is the human right. You can live without water. There's nothing you can do without water. That trailer put it in perspective that people aren't accessing water and people can't afford water and it's toxins in the water. Um, all along, while corporations um, make money off of that. So our right to live, again, it's been, if I can echo what's been said today, our right to live is going down because if we don't have water, we don't have life. So um, I just want to say we we have to get in the water fight. We have to continue to stay in the water fight. And hey, this is the union, the best union that I ever joined. So um, we have to take our right to live. We got to take back the water. We can't get it privatized like Marion said. So I'll just leave you guys with that. Thank you, Brianna. Right. Right. That was That was definitely on point. Thank you. So I hope that you out there who are just being introduced to welfare rights or who have been watching and, and following us the last couple of months through our truth commissions and, and hearings, that you all are now interested in coming join the fight with us. Um, we want to we want to remind everybody that um, if you oh we have an email if you want to send an email to nwru1987 at gmail.com. If you want to be on our mailing list and we'll be sending additional historical materials. We definitely want you to, um, to sign up and join up and get involved and engaged. We're a membership organization and we're, our ultimate goal is the end of poverty. And what we really want is to end the system that creates poverty and makes it a for-profit <laughs> occupation. Because mind you, people are getting rich off of our poverty, folks. Let us not be mistaken. We're the ones, the workers, the working class. We make and we produce everything, everything. We find it, we, we secure it, we harvest it, you know, we, we process it, then we put it out for sale. And then we also buy it. So we're clearly the group that the system needs the most, but it's the group that the system exploits the most. And the only way that'll stop is when we stop it. So that's why we're doing this organizing drive. Not just because we want more names to put on a roster, but because we know we need you engaged in this fight, which is not just ours, but it's yours. So that's, that's, that's one of the most important messages that I have here for you. Now, I know that we're going to hear from our president again, Marion. She knows she's the president, but I just wanted to remind her and say her name. Marion, Marion Kramer, Marion Kramer and Maureen Taylor. Those are two dangerous weapons that we have hiding out in Michigan. Well, they're not really hiding out because people do know about them, but uh, at least we do. So, Miss Marion, can we get you back, please? And watch. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you well. Now you want to hear me, you say, all, all I can say is that uh, the door is open for folks to join this fight. Uh, and uh, we waiting on those people that know that they're ready to take a step. So please listen to what Michelle has just said that, uh, you know, gave you the uh, place you can write to and what have you. And come on, we need you. The, uh, the working class, be we working, unemployed, sick, or whatever. We need you in this fight for a better world for uh, everybody. Although some people might kind of be uh, slowly that will be coming because those are the ones that have exploited and oppressed us. But you know, we're not like them. That's 
So uh, let's move forward and join the fight and let's have a better world and show them what, 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 uh, how long people can live with the type of program that's, that we want. That meets our needs. Thank you, Marion. Uh -huh. And I just, I also want to thank, well, I want to take this opportunity to thank the many folks that have helped to make this uh, program, what I think is a success. Uh, happy birthday, Welfare Rights Union, National Welfare Rights Union. I want to thank, I want to thank the different teams we had working on it, our tech team. Uh, it's represented by several people who are on, you saw today, including Colleen and Sierra, but Peter Kanoy that, that was mentioned earlier, he was an important part of that team, as well as Kristen and a number of us have, a number of us have like circulated through the different teams. I want to thank Larry Bressler, the head of our um, commissioners committee, who helped to uh, pull together the testimonies for the, the commissioner's report on economic human rights. Uh, I want to thank uh, our firebrand Rick, who was here talking about and raising the, the challenge of genocide. Uh, he, had, he has a place on the podium because his voice will be heard. I want to thank Reverend Liz and the National Poor People's Campaign Call for a Moral Revival. Uh, let's see, I wanted, oh, part of our tech team that I didn't mention is Carolyn Baker. Uh, she's also the, the key, key activist with the General Baker Institute, and she has been our main tech person. And, and she, she has shown, she has shown considerable patience and she has that, she's, uh, well, it probably helps that she's the daughter of our president, General Baker, because I guess she had her uh, patience to navigate those challenges. But we're glad that we had all of you on this call. We're glad that so many of you were able to join us today. Um, again, I'm Michelle Tingling Clemens. I am the, a founding member of the National Welfare Rights Union. I used to staff the National Anti-Hunger Coalition under the leadership of Annie Smart. And as Marion said, I, I keep, I've come in at different points and I have welfare rights. Not only would it not let me go, but I'm not willing to go anywhere because finally I found a group that is willing to fight for what is ours, to fight for what we need, to fight for our rights. Because I was saying that we are the class that makes and produces everything. We even make our own replacements. How can you beat that? You know, we are not going to ask or beg anymore. We are now demanding. And we're not just demanding, we're coming to get it. It's ours and we're coming to get it. All right, so join us. Again, the, the email is nwru1987 at gmail.com. nwru1987 at gmail.com. We are soldiers. In, in the welfare rights, we have we to have march, to march. Oh, and we have to die. We, we have to hold up the, the justice banner. banner. We've got to hold it up until, until we die. Because we are marching into battle, into battle. A million workers, a million workers all around. And we will carry, we will carry the red banner. We say, yeah, yeah, and we will never lay it down. Happy birthday, welfare right. Morning. Happy birthday, welfare rights. That's right. Go back and eat your chicken. <laughs> Happy birthday, welfare rights. <laughs> Beautiful oh, voice. Okay. Miss Mo. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Miss Mo, Ms. you Mo got, can you got sing another, a little bit. Uh, another career. Wow. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All part of the people and free the land. Thank all you, right, Michelle right. and Rick and everybody. Love you all. Love, Love you, you too. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.